Machiavelli, the 15th century politician, said, all courses of action are risky. So prudence is not in avoiding danger. Prudence is in calculating risk and acting decisively. Make mistakes of ambition and not mistakes of sloth. Develop the strength to do bold things, not the strength to suffer. Good afternoon, my name is Mamuna Fauna. I'm the founder and managing director of Insight Media and Communications. Communications is my specialism, and over the last few years, I've been frustrated by the use of the word, or misuse of the word resilient, to describe Sierra Leone and Sierra Leoneans. After each of our country's disasters, communities demonstrate an amazing resilience, in the vertical commas, uh, they, they have a tenacity, they have a tenacious will to survive. They absorb their setbacks, they rebuild. And life goes on. And life goes on almost exactly as before. In the process, we have lost golden opportunities to innovate and to improve. Time and time again, we experience the same misfortunes in the same way with exactly the same results. Instead, we need to build back better. We need to develop policies, we need to adapt our systems and our infrastructure so that we can withstand shocks. Sierra Leone has perfected the strength to suffer. When we develop the strength to do bold things, we will be amazed at the speed of our progress. How many of you here have read Paolo Coelho's novel, The Alchemist? Well, for those of you who haven't, The Alchemist is a story about transformation. And today, I'm going to talk to you about alchemy and transformation, the alchemy of risk. I'm going to explain how the alchemy of risk changes risk into opportunity and how we here in Sierra Leone can use the alchemy of risk to transform our country into the amazing, vibrant economy it should be. So what is the alchemy of risk? Most people, most of us, naturally look for ways to limit our exposure to risk. And this is quite understandable. By its definition, risk involves danger. However, if we study the decision the actions taken by countries, by enterprises, by families, by individuals, as they seek to better themselves. History shows that risk and opportunity go hand in hand. Think about the explorers, the scientists, the engineers, the architects, the business, or the artists, everybody who has well and truly excelled in their fields. Can you think of one, just one? who has achieved what they have achieved, who has achieved greatness without taking risks. At Insight Magazine, we write about high achievers and change makers. I can't think of one who has achieved what they have achieved without taking risks. So whether the challenge is exploring the depths of our oceans, the limits of space, the top of our highest mountains, the boundaries of scientific knowledge, running a successful business, or any vision that the people around you haven't yet managed to see. Great accomplishments invariably entail taking a giant step into the unknown. This process, transforming the base metal of risk into the gold, the gold of opportunity, is absolutely essential to discovery, to innovation, to invention, and ultimately to human development. This process is the alchemy of risk. As a nation, Sierra Leone has, it has amazing potential. We have great natural beauty, we have agricultural, mineral, geographical, human, marine resources. 
But if our country is to realise its potential, or if we are to realise our potential as individuals, we have to master the four steps of risk alchemy. Step one. Identify and recognize risk. In the last 15 years, Serolin has successfully consolidated peace and democracy. Our economic growth has improved overall, and our development indica indicators have improved. Nevertheless, we remain a high-risk environment. Some of our most obvious vulnerabilities include relatively short life expectancy, low levels of education, poor health care, high unemployment, food insecurity is widespread, and access to clean water and adequate sanitation is generally low. At Insight Media Communications, we focus on doing business in Sierra Leone, and we've researched a list of the business community's primary concerns. Top of the list. Vulnerability to weather events, and that's really not surprising given that flooding occurs every single rainy season. Secondly, investors are concerned about our over-dependence on commodity prices. And I think the revolving door of investors and our iron ore mines is really indicative of how fickle this sector is. The list of business risks goes on to include corruption, inadequate protection for property rights, the risk of another Ebola outbreak, poor infrastructure, a weak healthcare system, lack of credit for small and medium-sized enterprises, extreme poverty and high unemployment. So that begs the question, if the development of our country is compromised by these risks, what are we doing to reduce their negative impact? This takes us to step two. For our national security, for our development, for our progress, it is essential that we learn step two in the alchemy of risk. That is to manage our risks adequately. Now, there's a really good example of risk management taking place in Sierra Leone right now. And that's with the urgent flood mitigation work that's been undertaken by Freetown City Council under the new mayor, Yvonne Akisoya. Based on previous experience, we know that flooding takes place regularly. In the last 15 years, four major floods have affected over 220,000 people. In Freetown, average flood damage is estimated to be as high as $2.5 million a year. And of course, last year, one of our worst disasters, the Regent mudslide, the consequence of years of environmental damage, unregulated urban planning, and climate change. The final death toll listed over a thousand people dead. Three thousand people were displaced, hundreds of buildings were damaged or destroyed. I'm just going to repeat those figures because this was a preventable tragedy. One thousand people dead, three thousand people displaced. To tackle the scale of flooding in Freetown, the FCC's work will need to be sustained. It will need to be substantially strengthened and expanded upon. Nevertheless, it's a really laudable, proactive attempt to risk manage flooding in Freetown and mitigate its attendant dangers. The work will protect the communities involved. It will reduce the usual flood damage. It will very likely save more money than it costs. It will begin to unlock opportunities for development and unlock opportunities for progress. It will create confidence. People will feel more confident about going about their day-to-day -day lives, and this speaks to happier, healthier, and more productive communities. Local businesses may feel secure enough to invest a bit more in their enterprises, knowing that years and years of hard work won't be literally washed down the drain overnight. And it's early stages yet, but you know, in years to come, if the FCC continues this work, international investors may look across the pond and go, oh wow, flooding poses less of a problem in Freetown than before. And they may feel more confident about risking business ventures here. 
These are the outcomes of managing risk. But to truly maximize the opportunities that risk can bring, we have to progress to step three. We have to go from being risk managers to risk embracers. Now, if I'm to believe my parents, I'm a natural risk embracer, and actually, to be quite honest, most children are. When I was two, I started walking out of school to go exploring. And by the way, if there are any two-year-olds listening here, how old? <laughs> Please don't try this at home. In my head, there was a whole work stuff to learn. And what happened at school was only a tiny part of it. For a two-year-old, this, the walking around, leaving school, was a very risky strategy. There was the risk of being punished, obviously, for breaking the rules. We lived in Koiju in Connor, and there was the risk from the river, roads, as well as more general risks from strangers, snakes, etc. But if I remember those excursions so vividly today, it's because they were an immense source of enjoyment. And they're also pretty damn scary. And my first walkabout was obviously the most difficult. As time went on, they became easier, they became more productive. I learned how to get from school to my home. I learned that it was interesting to talk to people, I made friends. I learned that I could enjoy my own company for extended periods of time. I was able to walk much more closely by the river than if I was a responsible adult. And I saw up close the miners washing for diamonds. I learned that most people could be trusted. It only now occurs to me that my parents most probably sent me to boarding school to an end to those trips of mine. But by then, I'd learned the most important lesson, that embracing risk can be very, very rewarding. There are no obviously risk-taking personalities, so let's put an end to that myth. Risk is subjective. One person's risk is another's comfort zone. For example, if we take the fateful tortoise and the hare. It's a story we should all be familiar with. I think that's fair to say. Anybody who doesn't know the story of the tortoise and the hare? I'll recap quickly. The slow and steady tortoise challenges the speedy boastful hare to a race. The hare is confident of winning, so he shows off, he stops during the race, and he falls asleep. The tortoise continues to move very slowly, but without stopping, and finally, unlikely, wins the race. The moral of the story is that you can be more successful by doing things slowly and steadily than by acting quickly and carelessly. But I'd like to propose a different interpretation. I think this is a story about embracing risk. The hare is usually as the risk taker. He's fast, he's thoughtless, he's careless. This The slow and steady tortoise, in my opinion, is as much a risk taker as the hare. If you think about it, the race was contrary to the tortoise's natural talents. It exposed him to ridicule. It took him substantially out of his comfort zone, but he embraced the risk and it paid off. The hare, on the other hand, miscalculated the risks. He failed to manage them, and so he lost. Once we have learned to embrace risk, we can progress to step four, exploiting risk. A friend of mine, Philip, spent just one week in Sierra Leone some time ago. And in those seven days, he identified one entrepreneurial prospect after another. He saw opportunities everywhere. In the power sector, tourism, agriculture, the service sector, education, skills, training, transport, technology, you name it. As he was leaving, he said, there is so much opportunity here. I agree. I write about opportunity in Sierra Leone. A year and a half ago, I set up Insight Media and Communications with colleagues. It's a business magazine. We recognized that there was no business-focused magazine dedicated to Sierra Leone even though there are so many opportunities here and so many compelling stories to tell. Nevertheless, when Philip spoke about all the business prospects he had identified, we, the listening Serenians, highlighted one risk after another. 
We complained that business in Sierra Leone was too difficult, the environment wasn't enabling, the market too small, people didn't like change, blah, blah, blah. Some had tried and failed. And their bad experiences had made them wary of trying again. Philip said, we have two choices. The child who falls in the water can become a champion swimmer instead of being terrified of water. The person who gets bitten by a snake can become a snake charmer instead of running away at the sight of any and every snake. We went on to explain to Philip that firefighting, or constant risk management in the more mundane, boring areas of life in Sierra Leone, left us and many other people in Sierra Leone without the energy or the will to exploit the risk in more dynamic areas. Philip's response, if exploiting opportunity seems too risky, too hard, then please imagine continuing with the status quo. We all experience the consequences of mismanaged or unmanaged risk in Sierra Leone. For some of us, these consequences are bearable. Some people become casualties. Those who are swept away by floods or hardest hit by our health sector, most handicapped by the poor quality of our education, are those who cannot buy their way out of the system. A year or so ago, I attended an event in a village in Cambria. A new solar system for the local community health centre was being commissioned. In her speech, the midwife explained what solar power meant to the women who used that community health centre. She described how at night, when local women gave birth, they did so by the light of a mobile phone. I haven't got my phone on me, but I'd be really grateful if somebody here could show us what that looks like. Who has a mobile phone with a light on it? That is what they use to give birth at night. And I bet when Apple made the iPhone, they didn't imagine it would be an essential piece of equipment in delivery rooms in Sierra Leone. The new solar system makes this largely a thing of the past. There is a lot to be said for consistency, but at this phase of its development, Sierra Leone needs change. Without it, progress will continue to elude us, and scenarios such as the one that I've just described will continue to be the norm. I'm going to quote another wise man, Seneca. He's a first century philosopher. It's not because things are difficult that we dare not venture. It is because we dare not venture that things are difficult. Well over half population is under 30. This country, our country, is yours to mould. You have to become the critical mass of people who dare to venture. In 20 years time, Sierra Leone will be a reflection of your vision, a reflection of your courage, a reflection of your dedication, a reflection of your perseverance. It will be a reflection of your mastery of risk alchemy. So whether you're a tortoise or whether you're a hare, be bold. Be bold. Dare to venture. This country, your country, our Sierra Leone depends on it. Thank you.